Today's guest is absolutely amazing. His name is Joel Green. I have a feeling this is going to be a very popular episode. Uh, Joel is the author of The Immunity Code and now also another book called The Way Immunity Code Diet. He is a wealth of information. In addition to that, he's a very deep thinker, critical thinker, and I love the way he's looking at things. We get into a lot here from uh, the gut microbiome and how the immune system interacts with that. Um, his uh, teaching about three different metabolisms that are running our body, which I'll let him ex- describe. Um, we get into some carnivore, keto versus carbs type conversations. Um, we talk about butyrate and short chain fatty acids, butyrate, propionate, and acetate. And um, I really love that part. It's a little bit towards the end, but check that out in terms of um getting making butyrate through like a carnivore diet through just amino acids from protein versus carbs um that was a great part of the conversation and yeah we definitely see eye to eye in terms of doing extremes for too long is definitely uh, makes me uncomfortable and concerned (laughs) yeah and him too so we'll get into all that just you're going to be blown away. Um, oh, by the way, if you don't know what uh, short chain fatty acids are, um, essentially they, I mean, what don't they do? They're, they have so many different functions, but you really want to think in terms of like mental health, um, your immune system, um, your digestive health. Uh, they, they're signalers in the, in the body and they're really important. You have to have them. Um, but I like his um, ex- explanation of why you might want to consider making your butyrate from carbs and fibers versus only animal meats. So yeah, we'll go ahead and get into it. Amazing combo. Uh, We'll jump right in here is Joel Green. Okay, so Joel, super excited to have you on. I listened to you on Ben Greenfield's podcast. I know you've been on many other big podcasts. I think Ben said you were his biggest, most popular episode of 2020. So I was like, whoa, and you're just a wealth of information, a a critical thinker. I like how you're looking at things and questioning things, you know, and obviously you have a lot of information to make those type of connections with. So very excited to have you on the show today and share your perspectives with the audience. Thanks for being here. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I'm I'm actually excited to do your show. I've been looking at your social media and uh, I thought we could talk about a lot of stuff that'd be interesting. Yeah. So. Yeah. There's some crossover for sure. And you're so, <laughs> so knowledgeable on so many of these topics. Um, let's like, just start by talking about the fact that you wrote the immunity code and now you've come out with a new book, the way immunity code diet. And I like how you talk about three metabolisms running your body. I was wondering if we could kick it off there. You say there's three metabolisms running your body. What do you mean? Yeah, it's um, it's kind of a an extension of an idea that was in the first book, which was that uh, you, you have three genomes in your body, and that that really is the most accurate portrayal of genomics in the body. And it has a that has a practical application. It the practical application of that is in interpreting um, genomics in general. You know, there's this tendency to do a test and think, oh my gosh, that's me. Um, particularly when it comes to diet, and so you see genomic tests with all these recommendations, but the other half of digestion is the genes in the microbiome and and it it shifts the conversation significantly and it, it really is something that shouldn't be ignored because it's the more complete understanding and that same thing holds true um with metabolism and it's, it gets into some very important things um top of the list being that if, if we're going to say there's three metabolisms in your body just to name them it's your human metabolism um and then it's the metabolism within immune cells which will spend some time on here. And then it's the metabolism within the microbiome. Those are three separate and distinct metabolisms. And they, um, they all impact the body in different ways. Um, you know, particularly with, you know, kind of my focus, which has been an immune centric approach, the metabolism within immune cells in many cases probably dictates the, the health of the entire body. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's an unknown thing that it's known in immunology like that's all you talk about in immunology is shifting immune cell metabolism. But in terms of diet and just the general public, it's not even in the conversation. And oh. there's a practical outcome there. And the practical outcome there is there are simple, easy, basic things that anyone can learn to shift the metabolism within immune cells. And the impact is profound. And that's been my interest all along is, is because I, I came from a you know, a, a corporate gig working 
14, 15 hours a day. And I'd, I'd done fitness for 20, 30 plus years. And I just ran into the wall of time. And so things that have a massive impact that work, that kind of became my interest. And so, you know, one of the practical outcomes of immune cell metabolism is just body fat. And, and it, when you look at, when you look at adipose tissue and you look at what goes wrong with it, there's all roads will converge on immune cell metabolism. You look at obesity, you look at uh, cancer, you look at, um, you know, umpteen issues related to adipose mass, even, even sarcopenia. And it always comes back to the metabolism within immune cells. Like, you know, you've got too many of the wrong types of immune cells and the metabolism in those immune cells is doing things we don't want it to do. That's leading to all kinds of kinds of phenotypes that we really don't want. And the fixes for that are surprisingly simple. Like once you understand that it is possible to guide, shift, and steer the metabolism inside immune cells with specific sugars, it, well, first of all, you've been doing it all along. Everybody has, they just didn't know it. So sugar intake is one of the primary ways to, and by that, I mean sucrose. I just mean, you know, the junk American, sad American diet. One of the, one of the, never talked about problems with that is that you're unknowingly, unwittingly shifting immune cell metabolism towards um, what favors an obesogenic state, an oncogenic state, um, a gut dysbiotic state, and it's sugar. Well, you can take that same notion and take different types of sugars. So you can take trellulose, you can take D-mannose, you can take turinose, all these different types of sugars. And once you understand how they work, <clears throat> there are subtle differences between them that impact immune cell metabolism. And you get some nifty little tricks to create a better probability of getting the outcome that you want. So if it's obesity or if it's body fat, you want to, you know, you want fat to not be inflamed, adding um, mannose into the picture and ribose and doing that in a fasted state, you're actually creating these probabilities of targeting immune cell metabolism and, and just helping the equation down that road that you want it to go. Mm. Mm, so you're saying it's not just directly eating sugar, you eat in excess, mm. and now you have extra body fat stores, you're looking at it way deeper than that. And like, how is that impacting the the function of the immune system that creates a more higher probability of being obese, right, which I love. So can you share a little bit more like what happens to the immune cell function when mm. you eat sugar and that sad mm. diet? Yeah. And that, and that ties into the, you know, is a calorie, just a calorie argument because <laughs> one school of thought is that a calorie is just a calorie and sugar is just a calorie. Right. But once, once you pull that into the lens of immune cell metabolism, it's not, not at all because <clears throat> sugars in different, particularly sucrose, um, impact the metabolism within different types of immune cells, within T cells, within macrophages. These are just different types of immune cells. And the thing to understand is that the immune response has to, in essence, operate just like cancer, if you think about it. Okay. So what has to happen when there's a major insult to the immune system? You need a bunch of cells to proliferate rapidly. Okay. They're immune cells that you need, you need to all of a sudden, you need to create this signal state that's inflammatory by its very nature. Okay. So the entire inflammatory side of the equation in terms of signals needs to be turned on. You need interleukin 1B, tumor necrosis factor alpha, you know, interleukin 6, all these inflammatory signal cascades. And then the cells involved require a lot of rapid energy. So they cannot rely on, um, they can't rely on oxfos. They, they need Warburg metabolism to spin up. That's where they get the juice from. Well, what's the fuel for that? It's the same as a cancer. It's cancer cells spin up on sugar. Well, so do immune cells. That's mm -hmm. where they, that's where they get the juice to rapidly pro proliferate. You know, mm -hmm. cancer does the same thing. Cancer relies on sugar rapidly proliferates. So they, they utilize the same engine in order to proliferate. And that's what gives them the juice to drive the inflammatory onset. That's not bad. That's, that's actually essential. That's a good thing. In fact, uh, the practical application is post-workout. So post-workout, that's exactly what we want. You know, mm -hmm. the old, the old post-workout hack of, Hey, have something really sweet with your whey protein. And, mm -hmm. you know, the ethos, the bodybuilding ethos used to be, well, that helps drive, you know, amino acids into the cell. Mm -hmm. The other side of the equation is it actually helps inflame the heck out of you because, um, the immune cells that need to be recruited in post-workout, the inflammatory side, that's what you need. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Wow. It's not so great if you're talking about, um, adipose mass 
and you're talking about inflamed fat. So with inflamed fat, the reason it's inflamed is that you have way too many inflammatory immune cells in there, way too many inflammatory macrophages. You have a, you have a population density problem. Like there's too many, too many that's out of balance. And what do they do? They recruit. That's what inflammatory immune cells do is they recruit other types of immune cells. So they're putting out signal cascades and those signal cascades are all inflammatory by their nature. That's, that's absolutely fine in, in the, you know, post-workout or, you know, you get a cut or something temporary that leads to a resolution. That's mm -hmm. the worst thing possible in an ongoing state. That's the, that's the worst thing possible. And so you see with obesity um, and a lot of other issues, you see inflamed fat that's characterized by massive populations of inflammatory immune cells putting out inflammatory signals. And, you know, never mind the, the, the problem with weight, when you, when you go down that road, one of the, one of the reasons that fat and cancer are so closely related is that fat cells and cancer cells share a lot of similarities. Um, they have an infinite capacity to reproduce. Um, and when you sprinkle in massive inflammatory signals, which tends to go with a hypoxic state. So you, you stabilize hypoxia, you stabilize HIF-1, um, and you have basically this, this perfect recipe that's oncogenic in its very nature. It's, it's cancer promoting in its very nature. So that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's all comes back to the metabolism within immune cells. Wow. Yeah. Thanks for laying that out. Let's, um, let's shift a little bit into kind of, so since we're hitting metabolism, you know, um, and the gut is obviously such an area of expertise for you. Like, can we shift into maybe, maybe we can segue with sugar, but how the gut microbiome and sugar and other foods we're eating and all of it, how this, inter let's bring this piece into the table, the gut microbiome in terms of you, what we think of, you know, we say your metabolism. So we just <laughs> talk about one, but how is the interplay between our food, sugar, immune system with our gut microbiome impacting our health. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty loaded question. How isn't it? But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a good question. No, it's, I think it's actually a foundational question. Um, it, it's just been underserved, I think, in terms of some of the answers that are there. So the, the, the first thing to consider, everybody wants the same thing. Everybody wants real health that lasts. That everybody, yeah. we all, it doesn't matter what your dietology is, everybody's after the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so if that's the goal, we can all agree. Um, one of the things at the top of the list that you can't take off, like makes the top of everybody's list is the gut immune axis because mm -hmm. the, the, the immune system, the largest number of, of immune cells in the body is in the gut. Largest, largest number of macrophages is in the gut. And it's the place where the place where foreign matter first meets the human body. It's in the lungs, it's in the mouth, and it's in the gut. And so that's where the immune system first has to do its thing in terms of distinguishing self from non-self. And there's this, there's this kind of interplay that has evolved between our human cells, between it's kind of a three-way um, game. It's it's human cells interface with um, bacterial cells and those interface with immune cells. All three of them interface, all three of those. And that's where the three metabolisms really comes front and center. And so what you see in the gut is that um, we can kind of reverse engineer things that have to be in the diet of most humans based on what it takes to produce the optimal gut immune axis. And so you have to begin with bifidobacteria um, because when you look at the family of bifidobacteria, it is so involved with the human immune response and shaping the human immune response. It's involved in antigen sensing. It's involved in ratios of T cells. I mean, it, it's just, it's tough. To, it's tough to make a case, not for it. Now, you know, the, the contrarian will say, well, the Hazda doesn't have bifidobacteria. And so the answer to that is that, that that's very similar to like the argument would be that, you know, um, there are functions performed by bifidobacteria that perhaps other taxa of, of bacteria can, can perform, but most people are not adapted to have those. The vast majority of humans today are adapted to have bifidobacteria directing and controlling the immune system. So, so, so the, the family of bifidobacteria 
is at the heart the heart of the gut of the gut immune axis and the the downstream interplay of that drives a lot of things like you can you can look at wonky ratios of different species of bifidobacteria and you can explain autoimmune issues like arthritis coming directly from that and so what you'll see is that when you're overrepresented in in certain types of bacteria in the gut let's say um you know just just things that we don't want they are the metabolism within those is producing um, downstream metabolites or molecular associated microbial patterns, MAMPs, that ultimately is triggering different aspects of the immune system and s- restoring the phytobacteria to optimal ratios can do things like it can change the ratios of T cells. You can get less T17s, more TH1s, and you can see amelioration of things like autoimmune issues. So what goes hand in hand with that is that bifido seems to act as a controller on other essential bacteria. So the other really important bacteria in there is the gut um, mucin forager, acromantia. Mm. And I wrote a lot about that in my first book. And in, in my first book, nobody really kind of knew about acromantia. And the, the goal was to give people a simple way to target bifido and acromantia. And then kind of what happened after that book came out is, is the, 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 the entrepreneurial space jumped on that and was just mm-hmm. like, Hey, you need acromancia. That's all you need. You know, get more. Right. And the the problem with that is acromancia. You can think of as a starvation bacteria. It, it's, it proliferates uh, by starvation, it proliferates by phenols. Um, the basic thing with it is that it eats the gut mucus layer. And in doing so it triggers a whole host of responses. It triggers the muse two genes. You get thicker mucus. It triggers um, secretory IgA. You get, you get an optimal blend of, of the immune response between bifido and acromancia, but the controller, you can't have too much acromancia because too much of it will, will eat through the gut lining. Um, the controller is bifido. So what bifido does is it keeps excess populations of acromancia um, from, from taking over. And so if you have optimal bifido, optimal acromancia, then that's kind of the core of the gut immune axis. That's not to say there aren't other players in there, but you know we can get what we want by targeting these two. And so what you find is that in reverse engineering, how do we do that? You find a lot of popular diets of this age actually are maladaptive long-term. So if you look at, um, well, how do we get optimal bifido? You kind of have to have certain types of carbs in the diet in order to do that. And when you eliminate those, you're going to suppress bifido. Certain types of diets will increase acromancia, but at the expense of bifido. And ultimately, long term, that's not a good thing at all. That you'll right. have people that point to that, and you know they'll 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 say like, oh well, you get more acromancia, that must be good. Not necessarily, not unless you have bifido with that. So mm-hmm. all that to say, um, sugar in this equation sort of adds fuel to the fire, suppressing um, bifido bacteria, suppressing the ratios that we want and essentially taking the essential aspects of the gut immune axis and really challenging that is, is probably the best way to put it, you know, driving inflammation in the gut through, um, through the metabolism of bacterial metabolites of bacteria that feed on sugar and ultimately produce an immune response. And so, yeah, so the whole aspect of like sugar is a calorie, you got to factor in the immune system and you got to factor in the metabolism of immune cells because, um, you, you can't leave it out of the picture. And, and a lot of, the, so many of the issues we see today, gut dysbiosis and IBD and all that, you know, they're, they're related to years of poor diet and, and different types of poor diet. So you were doing mm-hmm. the sad diet and, mm-hmm. and you wrecked your gut on that. And then you thought, well, maybe I'll do a carnivore diet. And you did that. And then you did that. And you did that way too long. Then you wrecked your gut more. And so it's these extremes of diets that are really hurting people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I use a microbiome labs stool analysis in my coaching. So they at least do the whole genome sequencing. Right. And, and, and it's been very eye opening to take a look at like actual keystone species levels and people. And, you know, is there a high amount of Ruka microbia or signs of leaky gut? And, and I see exactly what you're talking about every time. Like if there is acromantia it, and it's elevated, we see almost no bifido. They, they test for three different keystone species of bifido right and there but it's almost like those will none will be there or maybe a trace amount of one of them and then acromancia is overgrown or you know some, a lot of times we'll see no acromancia right and i like your point that it's like it's not necessarily good to see a high amount of acromancia since they are mucin eaters we don't want that out of control 
either. So I like, I mean, I see in real time what you're talking about with that kind of that, the balancing act, right. Is definitely what we always want in the gut, right. This, this abundant amount of good guys, right. To help keep the, the, I, I don't even like to say good or bad, right. Cause the good guys can become the bad guys. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Right. right. When they're yeah. overpopulating, yeah. you know, <laughs> absolutely. But, yeah. yeah. Um, so, okay. So in terms of this, uh, let's, let's hit on acromancia and bifido for a minute. Cause acromancia, I mean, as far as I know, you can't supplement, just take an acromancia supplement. Although there are people out there, I don't know, there's companies out there from the microbiologists that I know and people I really trust. They're like, nah, what's your thoughts on that? Can you supplement acromancia in, you know, June, 2024? <laughs> Well, just because you can doesn't mean you should, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like this is one of the most disturbing trends to me is um, creating supplements and drugs where they don't need to be supplements and drugs. Right. right. Um, I mean, I just the one of the one of the problems with um, the space in general is that you you draw people who are enthusiastic, but don't have a background and right. then their enthusiasm leads them to, you know, jump into venture. And sometimes you can have people who are good at raising money, but, but they don't right. really understand the space and they'll have an idea in their head and they'll jump into the space based on that idea. And it's, a, it, the, the idea is flawed, but they'll build an entire, you know, juggernaut business on that. And it's all based on a flawed idea. So yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, acromancia as a supplement is a hundred percent a flawed idea, but I think that, um, 90 Five percent of the cases involved, you can you don't need it. You can just yeah. simply increase it by understanding a few simple dietary tricks. And I've seen it. I mean, I have seen it in the thousands of times. People mm -hmm. increase acromancia rapidly, like in a week, two weeks. So the case becomes, well, then I don't have a, any acromancia. And then my response to that would be, well, we don't know that for sure because right. the t the tests are not one hundred percent foolproof. Most of the tests totally. out there, totally. So we don't know and that your gut changes constantly too, you know? So, right. It's like the weather. I mean, the gut is right. the body's weather. So mm -hmm. um, to take a snapshot of the weather and go, oh gosh, it's cloudy. Here's what we're going to do. Well, you know, next thing you know, by the time you implement your solution, it's not cloudy. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, I guess I would say, I know that um, one company out there, as as far as I know, they their acromancy supplement is engineered mm -hmm. to not live in the body on its own. So I'm not a fan of that. Um, I just, I just think me personally, this is my take that I just think you can do it. I think you can completely manipulate the gut through substrate. And I do think that yeah. there is a role for probiotics, but it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's, it's like a scalpel in its nature. It's very selective in its nature. So mm -hmm. there are times when I have a coach's course and we teach a lot of this stuff. Um, there are times when, yeah, it makes a it makes a lot of sense to use this particular probiotic for two to three weeks and then, and then you go off it. And that, that's mm -hmm. the real use. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that's not talked a lot about with probiotics nowadays is that a lot of the probiotics are coming loaded with resistant genes. And so mm. when you're doing this continual probiotic supplementation, you're taking in resistant genes mm. and nobody really knows what the downstream of that is. Mm. Mm, yeah. And I'm assuming, you know, I, I told you before we started, I'm like, your, your team booked this so fast. I haven't had a chance to read the way, but I'm assuming these are things that you're sharing in that book of how to kind of build your, your journey, your map, what, to, what to actually eat to impact the gut microbiome, the immune system, all of that. I would assume that's what the book is. <laughs> yeah. That that's the purpose of it. Yeah. I, that, well, the two purposes, um, the number one purpose, I, I wasn't going to write another book after my last one. I was like, I'm, I'm good. No more of this. <laughs> uh, but two reasons um, for the new book. One was the biggest reason is just confusion. Um, I, I really felt that the framework of diet is so outdated that we need a, an entirely new framework to understand diet. And by framework, what I mean is, um, let me give you the analogy. When it comes to SSRIs, um, I remember in 93, Prozac was released and there were books like written on the wonders of Prozac, like listening to Prozac and you talk to people and they talk about Prozac. They're like, oh my gosh, this changed my life. It's the greatest thing ever. Right. Okay. You come back 15 years later and talk to them and go, that was the worst thing I ever did. Right. Worst thing I ever did. It screwed me up. It screwed up my moods. Mm. It took years to fix. Mm. So, so the framework now, when you read science papers, um, incorporates the, the totality of 
the experience of SSRIs. And you'll read a lot of science papers that say, um, yes, there are lots of benefits to SSRIs, but the long-term negatives may outweigh right. them. And we suggest caution in their application. That's a framework that's missing right. in diet. What you mm -hmm. see today in diet is a is the 1993 version of, of diet. You, you see like, you see like, no dude, I did carnivore for three months and it's changed my life, you know? And, and I just, I can, I can guarantee you the same thing is going to happen like 20 years later. Oh man, I wish I knew then what I know now. So, so the primary reason for the new book was, was I felt there was a framework that needed to be in place that incorporated things that are just real, like real things that you're going to run into. It, you're just not going to run into it unless you do this 15, 20 years. And that was kind of the, the big purpose nice. with it. Nice. And this is where we really get along professionally. I can't wait to read it by the way, but you know, like my book is short-term keto, same kind of thing, right? It's just like, well, okay. You know, maybe using this as it's, what did you call it? A scalpel with, with the probiotics? Like that's how I look at like any sort of dietary extreme is like mm -hmm. this. I, I, I usually say it's like a very powerful sword and it need to be, needs to be wielded wisely. And also through feedback uh, and lo a lot of listening from the, what that person's body is saying about it, you know, like I full, full honesty, I've had people go into keto and like they get their period back and their PCOS symptoms go away and their gut feel and, they, and they're just like thriving. And I've had people who go on like women, especially perimenopause and they go into it and they all of a sudden they go into early menopause. I'm like, Whoo! No, you know, they're like not having their period all. I'm like, whoa, and we've optimized everything. I'm like, ow, 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 let's bring, you know. And so just, I think when you work with people directly, you become less and less dogmatic. It's like, we're not robots and that doesn't happen every single time. And we need to look at a lot of factors here, you know, and especially I'm very big on like listening to what that person's body is saying back to us about the approach that we're taking. Um, and so, yeah, I, any extreme, I just see when, you know, maybe a couple things are going up Well, something else, while you're up regulating something, you're down regulating something else when you're in an extreme. And so if you stay that like that too long, those down regulations go really down, you know, and even the up regulations can go a little too up. Right. And so, yeah. Can you share your thoughts on staying in a dietary extreme for too long? Mm -hmm. And let's specifically hit on a case for carbs and keto and carnivore since these are hot mm -hmm. topics right now. Yeah. So this is where the paradigm or rather framework is completely missing. It's, it's like a, it's like a lens, it's like a pair of glasses that once you put it on, you're like, what the heck were we thinking? You know, mm -hmm. that's what's missing. And what's, mind blowing to me is like you're an exception i would say you start talking to people who should know better and they and they they're dogmatic like on these polarized extremes but at mm -hmm. the highest level it's to say this that at the top of the at the top of the tree to understand anything you have to understand that the body is a, a homeostatic mechanism so it's always driven towards homeostasis homeostasis of for millions of different factors that are all balanced into this perfect equation. And so the imbalance of anything too much, pushing one lever down too much can push another lever up too much. And so one of the key realities I talk about in the new book that I introduce, and I don't know why this is missing. It, this should have been here 30 years ago is I just show, I just show a, uh, a graph of looks like a sine wave of like uh, the first phase is the benefits phase. And the benefits phase is like the honeymoon. It's like the romance. Right. It's it's like, oh man, this is the best thing ever. You know, or, you know, this guy's the best guy ever. Nobody's ever <laughs> treated me this nice. And he's so great. And, you know, and then there's kind of the honeymoon's right. over phase, the middle phase, which is like, you know, uh, this guy can be a butt sometimes, but he's my guy, you know. And then the, <laughs> the and then the negatives phase is like, you know, he's a narcissist. I couldn't <laughs> see it at first and just like, wow, <laughs> if I had just seen what a toxic narcissist, you know. Oh my God. And so, but that's exactly true. It's so of, true. That's 100% right. true of, of, it's true of anything. So With we gave diets. the, yeah, but it's, mm -hmm. we, you know, we gave the, we gave the SSRI analysis, right, you know. Right, just, right. So that same framework, you just, just apply that over, over anything nice. dietary or supplementary, supplementary. It's true of steroids, it's true of anything. Wow. And what you see is that with everything you do, there's a benefits phase and 
that's amazing usually, but then there's a, a, a tapering off and attenuation phase. And then there's usually, if you do too much of something for too long, there's a negatives phase where um, the benefits are essentially gone. And then mostly it's just negatives. And so that's especially true with diet, especially true with diet. When you've done this stuff long enough, like you and I have done it, you know, quite a while, you see these things play out consistently, consistently. Yeah. Yep. And, and so this is true of, um, and there's an, and this leads into the second reality, uh, another reality I talked about in the, in the new book, which is just what's missing. It's just, it's just inventorying time. It's just inventorying. So the question becomes, Hey, is a carnivore diet good? Or is a keto diet good? And the answer becomes not yes, no, it becomes at what point in time? That's the answer. Um, and then you see that's true of, um, it's really true of everything. It's even true of like, I mean, you can kick, you make a case for anything, but that's true of protein. You know, like, like mm -hmm. I just, yeah. I just did an, another podcast and a lot of like, mm -hmm. you know, guys into lifting, listen to that. And I was like, no, you can, you can do too much protein. It was like, bro, whoa, whoa, bro. <laughs> Don't go there. You went there. You know, it's like, no, you, you could actually die eating too much protein. Oh, that's BS, dude. I've been on a carnivore diet. Three, yeah, dude, you've been eating modern Holstein cows up there are 30, 35% to 50% fat. That's, 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 that's a keto diet you've been eating. That's not right. hundred percent protein. Okay. hundred percent protein, no fat would kill you in two weeks. Totally. Your so hormones just go to, it would be a brutal one too. Cause you have no brain power the whole way out. I actually, uh, that actually happened to me once too. I, I did this really extreme diet, uh, in my first book called the Daisy cutter, where I took fat to zero for like, I don't know, seven days. And by that oh. seven day, literally my brain was shutting off. Like I, Right. I just I couldn't even people would say things to me and my I couldn't even process what they were saying. I was like, okay, right. this is bad. I'm going right off this. And there are still bodybuilder coaches today, right now, that will <laughs> during peak week and stuff will put their contestants on pure protein, white fish. That's it. No fat, no carbs. You know, like a guy was telling me, he's like, I was just going from like steroids injection to steroid injection just to to live. You know, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> your body will let you know real quick when it needs more fat. I, I did yeah. a bikini competition as an experiment as a coach. And that was one thing I learned. Like if your fat gets too low, like your whole brain will just be like, eat fat now. <laughs> Shut, it, it, it's, it's amazing how fast it hits you too. It just, yeah. it just shuts off. Like you can't even think. Right. I mean, right. Like, right. but all that to say in the context of um, the modern, modern diets that we, you know, we think are advanced, which. Um, you know, today we think the, the, the modern thought on diet is so advanced. It's not, it's actually missing a framework and it's, it's quite behind, I think, but it's to say that as protocols go, these things can be extremely useful. So a keto diet can be life-saving. It can be incredibly useful. I use it in my protocols. Right. I'll, I'll have a, like a suggestion, like, Hey, let's, okay. You do this with these and do three weeks of keto and that does that. Right. Right. Um, and the same with a carnivore diet can be extremely utilitarian, very useful. Right. These are not the, there's only one path, as far as I'm concerned, that will obtain real and lasting health. And it doesn't matter if it takes you 10 minutes or 50 years to figure this out. It's a nutrient-dense, diverse, health, healthy, balanced diet. That is the only path that ultimately is going to lead right. to health. And everything else is this distortion yep. that's saying something that's impossible. And what it is is this. It's that the way to lasting health is through imbalance. That goes directly against how the body works. If we just come back to homeostasis, anytime you hear that the way to lasting health is imbalance this, it can't work because homeostasis governs this thing and it always, it. always, always plays out. So, yeah. And I think, you know, I always say there's those few exceptions, like maybe you have uh, epilepsy or something, and you're using some sort of modification as medicine through food, right? Um, few tiny exceptions like that. And even then it's like, we don't know what's possible. Maybe you could restore enough homeostasis in your body that you don't have to do keto anymore. You know, I don't know, like someone will have to uh, pioneer that a little bit, but I totally agree. I think that part of the reason these extremes have become so popular is because we have been so out of balance the other way with all sugar, processed foods, highly refined carbs, just out that was a huge imbalance and so something like keto or carnivore comes in and it's like a pendulum swing to get back to this place faster the problem is is that like we have like you said like doctors huge influencers saying like no don't ever go back into balance never go back into balance and 
it's concerning. It is concerning to me, you know, because the, it, most of the people consuming that content there, they don't have the base, the background information like you have to be able to really make a educated um, opinion of that information or of that energy that they're receiving from this person who is so educated. Right. So I appreciate your balanced look at things and, um, and doing the work of writing another book to give this kind of information for people to consider. Yeah. What you're saying is that, um, there are people with really great credentials that haven't actually done what they're talking about long enough to really know yeah. they're leveraging, they're leveraging their credentials to make you think they know what they're talking about, but they actually haven't done it for years and years and years. So they actually don't know, yeah. which gets to, um, I'm just kind of cliff noting the, the new book really quick. Cause I think it's relevant here. Um, there's, there's two, there's two things that need to be part of the framework to understand diet. One is, um, what I call first timers syndrome. And I, you know, you probably have a name for it, but it's just, it's the reality that a body that is fresh, meaning, meaning it's the first weight loss journey. It's the first body transformation. It's not the diet. Any diet would work. It's it's the radical change in diet. And it's mm -hmm. the fact that the body is fresh. The body doesn't have any built up resistance anywhere to dropping body fat. So that kind of sounds like woo, like, oh, built up resistance, you know, but, th but there's actually mechanisms that can be quantified one after another. Like you can get into this and look at, no, actually you shrink and contract adipose mass. You're driving very specific, different types of collagens. You're driving collagen 6A23 into the extracellular matrix and 6A23 endotropin is generating all of these you know, constant inflammatory signals. And so you're driving fibrosis into the adipose mass and then doing that year after year after year, what's happening is you're getting fibrosis in the adipose mass. And so that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's one factor. And there's, there's, all, there's, a list, there's literally a list of mechanisms we could go over mm -hmm. to just show that there's an accumulated cost to um, repeated weight reductions. Now, whenever I talk to bodybuilders, they know that. Or when I talk to like fighters, they know that. They're like, yeah, dude, weight cutting is really hard on the body. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, and it gets harder. They, they know that because they've done it. Yeah, so right. the real experts are people who've done chronic weight cutting. They know yeah. because they've done it. Those are the real right. experts. And right. I find even you talk to people who are in their fifties, who've done like uh, repeat diets, you know, their whole life. And they know mm -hmm. more than a lot of experts. Cause they're like, yeah, that's not going to work because. <laughs> right. And so, so that, that understanding is that there's a, there's a first time effect where you could produce the most amazing results on someone from almost any diet. And it's not the diet, it's the fact they've never done it before. And so you right. see so many people become influencers based on, oh yeah, you know, I right. was fat, I dropped this weight and that was the answer and I wrote a book. And right. if we just collectively understood, nah, that's just the first time effect. Right. It, it, it would really help that quite a bit, so. Nice. Um, on this note of kind of still hitting on these, you know, big extremes, I heard you on a Q and a, it was like a Q and a with Ben on Ben Greenfield's podcast, like a follow-up to your interview. And you were talking about butyrate oh, and yeah. this is, I just wanted to have you share this. Cause I loved your, what you had to say about this because that's a big thing with carnivore diet, right? Mm -hmm. Like, okay. Mm -hmm. Four chain fatty acids. Mm. Yes, you can make butyrate on a carnivore diet, but I loved your perspective. Would you mind sharing about butyrate coming mm -hmm. from plants mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. meat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> only. this one really, this, <laughs> only meat. <laughs> this needs to be put to bed forever. Um, <laughs> it really does because if you, if you, okay, so let's, let's begin with the idea that the production of butyrate is, is accomplished by bacteria and the fermentation of either amino acids or what we call sacrolytic fibers or, or fibers, carbs. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so the first problem is that bacteria that ferment amino acids are nowhere near the same as bacteria that are going to ferment fiber. They're completely different, completely different phyla, taxa, and the end products you get are not the same. So to equivocate here, when you go and trace down the butyrate synthesis pathways from fiber fermenters versus amino acid fermenters, there are some really stark differences. Just to kind of simplify them out, it's basically this. The fiber fermenters are going to produce lots of antioxidants and then butyrate, propionate, and acetate. And in almost every case, in the production of butyrate, the fermentation process takes um, acetate through a salvage pathway, takes it back up and ferments more butyrate. So the ratios you get of acetate, butyrate, and propionate are optimal. You get, you get more butyrate, you get a little bit less acetate. 
you get a different story when you ferment from amino acid fermenters. Yes, you can get butyrate, but it's, it's a very different story. So the first thing to understand is that by and large, you really don't want amino acid fermenters doing their thing in the gut. Um, at the top of the list would be, you can get butyrate from fusobacteria nucleatum. Mm. And fusobacteria, like if you do, one of the best uses of a gut microbiome test is to see if you have fusobacteria. Because you're going to get cancer, I guarantee it. If you have fusobacteria, cancer's coming. It's just a question of when. Okay. Mm. So you don't want to ferment that, and it ferments amino acids, and you can make butyrate from fusobacteria. Um, so, so that's that's a separate case. Never mind mm. fusobacteria. But apart from that, where you get antioxidants and you get the optimal ratios of butyrate pianate acetate, you have different butyrate synthesis pathways over on the amino acid fermenter side. Many of those participate in either what's called the ketogenic or the lysine pathway, a couple different pathways. Some of those pathways lack the acetate salvage. So you're getting different ratios of butyrate, propionate, and acetate. You're getting more acetate, less butyrate. But then the really important thing is you're not really getting the antioxidants that you would get on the other side of the equation. You're getting ammonia instead. So so now let's just think, think about our outputs here. The, right. the first thing to understand is that the inside of the gut lining by its very nature needs to be highly oxidized. Okay. So it's it, depending on where you're at in the colon. Um, it's, it's kind of slightly hypoxic anyway, and it's, it's oxidizing in nature. So you need those antioxidants in there to maintain homeostasis. Right. When you start subtracting those antioxidants out and then you start increasing ammonia, you got a real problem. It's a very different, very different. Yeah, you've got butyrate, but you've got problems as well. So you don't right. really want to be sustained levels of ammonia um, in the gut lining. Now, you'll hear people say, oh, well, that's, you know, I went on a carnivore diet and it cured all my problems. Okay. And what's going on is when the, when the um, gut lining gets inflamed and it, it gets compromised, Usually what's going on in there is you've got the wrong taxa of bacteria anyway. You've, you've just, you've, you've, you've really screwed things up and you don't have the right bacteria in there. But once inflammation sets in in the gut lining, um, it can be really challenging to get it down. So there are good cases for cessation of like carbohydrates in there because the butyrate transporters don't work once it's really inflamed. And what you find is that the aminos and meat, they really soothe the intestines. They really help the intestines to kind of calm down and soothe. And so you can see it, uh, you can see an improvement temporarily in the picture there, but then following that path of the benefits, you know, the, the wonderful guy, he's okay. Mm -hmm. He's a bum, you know, that phase, mm -hmm. what you, what happens long-term is the live, the levers begin to shift um, long-term. And so what you see long-term is I have seen people, I mean, they started off down this path of fasting and, you know, keto and carnivore and it fixed all their problems. And then you, you check in on them five years later and they, they've got IBD issues they can't fix. And what happened is that you suppressed bifidobacteria production, you increased acromancia production, you increased ammonia production, and you just, you just got issues because there was a point where it made a lot of sense. It was mm -hmm. kind of what you needed up to a point, mm -hmm. but then you needed to begin slowly building back the the diverse gut microbiome exactly. and slowly 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 titrating other foods in and building your exactly. diversity back up and that never happened and then you got the tail right. end of things which isn't so good right not so. to mention like I, I shared on my instagram story today a video from you not to mention this long-term ketogenic carnivore state you were sharing that over time that can create, you know, at first you might get, become more insulin sensitive. So talking blood sugar, but over time, and I see that, I see this constantly, not only the fact that, you know, we've seen, yes, it is uh, animal research, but it usually takes about two weeks when someone who hasn't been eating carbs at all to have any sort of normal blood sugar response to eating carbs, right? Cause their pancreas is just not like used to having to put out that much insulin. And you see all this fear mongering stuff, from like the carnivore, like I ate carbs and my blood sugar skyrocketed. They're so bad for you, you know? And I'm like, do you not read the research or do you like, do you not think of it? Do you not know? Or are you just like lying or like, you know, <laughs> I have to admit yeah. these are thoughts that go through my head. I'm like, yeah, mine too. 
is this innocent or do you just, I don't know, is this business? I don't, I don't know what's going on here, but I feel like you should know that it's like pretty basic. But yeah, could you share also like from an insulin sensitivity standpoint, staying too mm -hmm. low carb for too long? Yeah. So again, we all agree what we want is lasting in real health. Everybody agrees. Okay. So let's reverse engineer that and from an insulin perspective. So there's no lasting health, none without optimal insulin function. Okay. It, do, it doesn't matter. Like you can, everything else can work right. And if insulin isn't optimal, you're not going to have real and lasting health. That's, that's a non-negotiable. So, um, to get there, what's it take? Well, there's, there's a family of hormones that surround insulin. There's glucagon, there's GLP-1, there's GIP, there's adiponectin, which is really underserved. There's insulin itself. And then there's the microbiome. They all work together. All of them work together in concert. Yeah. And so again, going back to that levers analogy, you know, if you stimulate one too much, let's take the case of glucagon. Okay. So you're always stimulating glucagon, always pushing glucagon up. What can happen is that you know, the, the insulin sensitivity, so you're pushing glucagon up, the insulin sensitivity can actually go down. Okay. And then if you stay in that gear too long, all kinds of issues can begin to develop. Like you can get insulin resistance, like, like real insulin resistance from hyper, from too much glucagon stimulation, which you get from, um, excessive fasting or prolonged super high protein. Either one of those can, can, and if we just come back mechanistically and go, well, what's happening? It's well, there's other pieces of the equation. There's, there's insulin itself needs kind of regular sharpening, regular stimulation. And so we find that, you know, there's all kinds of foods that are bad. They're carbs, allegedly, like, you know, chickpeas and, you know, different types of fibers that actually sharpen insulin function, actually make it more sensitive. And they make a good case for being in the diet. Never mind the fact they stimulate the microbiome, which through bile acids and other mechanisms sharpens insulin function through GLP-1, all these other things. But it's just to say that... <clears throat> By neglecting um, one aspect of insulin function, like uh, insulin, and then overstimulating another, like glucagon, which you see with very often with like carnivore, low carb, or keto diets, over time, up front, they actually make insulin work much better. Like you get insulin sensitive, but long term, we start mm -hmm. to see shifts happen where there there are science papers out right now that you know talk about like. Are low carb diets predisposing diabetes? I didn't write them. I'm, these are scientists that are writing these papers. And, and the keto world, just by the way, just writes it. It's just like, oh, it, it's like, won't even look at it. Oh, they're silly. They don't know anything. Okay, keep going. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, so the, I think the horsepower oh. for this is in the anecdotal. Like, um, I mean, yeah. I'm sure you have, I, I've got hundreds of people that, you know, will give testimonies that say, oh, yeah, that worked for me up front. But then boom. And, you know, some of them are diabetic. Some of them have issues now. They never had before. Their fasting insulin shoots to the roof. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that. But you have. You're saying you have seen that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but but it, it just makes sense if you, if you think about it, you know, like example would be, let's take the, there's an inverse relationship between saturated fat and insulin. Or excuse me, saturated fat and adiponectin. Okay. So adiponectin, you really don't want to neglect that one because it's so adiponectin is an adipokine. It's a hormone your fat makes, and it sensitizes insulin, makes it work better. But it also uh, stimulates muscle synthesis, and it does a lot of other things. So adiponectin, we definitely want to make sure that that's in the picture. You know that mm -hmm. that we're stimulating adiponectin through the diet. So you can go on a certain type of diet, and that diet espouses a view that you know, there's no, there's no limit to saturated fat intake. We could have as much as we want. And then we add in another variable. You're older. Let's say you're over 45, you're over 50. So you have issues with your cardiovascular system that you really haven't inventoried yet. So you're taking in a bunch of saturated fat, you're suppressing adiponectin production. Eventually you're going to be suppressing insulin sensitivity just by downregulating adiponectin. Right. Okay. Right. So all that to say, um, it's really interesting because nature has kind of afforded a way around this. Like, like right. people, like you start listening to what I'm saying, you're like, Oh, it's too complex. I can't, I can't process this. <laughs> and, and you just basically look at what happens in nature, which is yeah. if you did uh, just, I'd like to watch, uh, I like to watch alone, you know, <laughs> you, you get a real good picture for how nature mm -hmm. forces everybody into the exact same pattern, everybody. So everybody mm -hmm. in nature starts out by just eating anything they can get. And then because there's no refrigerators, there's this constraint that constraint mm -hmm. defines diet and it's called scarcity. Right. And a lot of modern diets are based on eliminating scarcity. They're based on the fact 
no, dude, you need a refrigerator. You need to stock it with this stuff, okay? Right. And, and and just eat this stuff. But you, you can't do that in nature. Right. So nature has these protections where by virtue of just kind of eating anything you can get your hands on, you actually stimulate everything optimally. And stimulating everything protects you against too much of anything. Mm. So... Yeah. Going back to what you were saying about, you know, the carnivore, essentially like what I'm just hearing, and and at least this is probably because this is how I feel. If you are willing to cut fiber out of your diet entirely for like the rest of your life, I know that we, you know, love to use like the Inuit example. Um, and by the way, they didn't have a super long life expectancy, but that could have been environmental factors too. But yes, I know there's some extreme cases like that, but overall for billions, maybe trillions of people who have lived on the planet, like you are an experimental group of what's going to happen long-term on that. Right. And so it's just like, to me, I'm a more of an abundance mindset person. Yes. I totally understand if your, your guts on fire and every time you eat a carb, it's just like, you're like ex nine months pregnant. And like, I totally get and have used carnivore as an intervention in those cases. Right. Yeah. It's just like, I need right. to be able to think straight and like live my life for a second. Right. So you can get rid of some of those things, but the goal is not to stay there. The goal is not to stay in this um, elimination scarcity. It's scarcity, right? It's like, I have to stay in this scarcity because I, you know, I'm this different human who can't eat like other normal people. And I just, I really challenge that. I mm. really challenge that like through healing. Mm. Like, I don't mm. believe that's true. I mean, maybe if you were mm. like 0.0001% of the population, but the mm. amount of people that we have out there now, like just feeling like I, I don't get to ever live like a normal person. I have to only eat meat, you know, mm. it's just, mm. I really would challenge that. And I would also throw out there, like for those of us who are deep into the gut microbiome, I, on the test that I've run of people coming off carnivore or near carnivore for a long time, I have never seen good things in, in stool tests. And that's why I find it very interesting when I hear these like huge carnivore proponents who, by the way, their entire businesses, business models are to be proponents of the carnivore diet. When I hear them saying, oh, all these good things are happening. I'm like, can I see your gut? tests or can I see your people's gut test? I've never seen that. You know, it's not like I haven't had a lot. I really would. I would love to see the gut tests of long-term car carnivore diet because I would just love to see what's out there. But in my experience and, you know, small handful of clients that I've had come through, it, it has not been good. It has not been good at all, you know, and you're not because you're not feeding mostly most of your gut bacteria really love different types of fibers, right? So I don't know, I was just kind of hearing as you're explaining those extremes, it's just like fiber, in my opinion, I, I think that's the part of insulin sensitivity, as you kind of described, that we forget about in the keto carnivore world, right? Because I know people who have cure, cured their diabetes, yeah, pretty much, you know, with a vegetarian diet. And you tell that to a carnivore person and they're going to say, no way, you know? Oh, yeah, like, yeah. Well, they did though. So what you think? <laughs> you know, and so we forget about the importance of fiber and insulin sensitivity sometimes in those worlds. So I appreciate you bringing that to the discussion. Yeah. There, I, I look at, there's two things going on. Uh, one is that the semantics that we use program our brain to think a certain way. Yeah. And you got to remember, you didn't invent those words. You're just using <laughs> words other people gave you. And so you're allowing the words other people gave you to control how you think by programming your brain by using them. So when you use the, we use the word fiber, well, like if you ever take a, it's a really interesting deep dive is to go and look at all of what, what's under the umbrella of fiber and look at like what each thing does and look at all the genes activated and you come away going, this is a bad word. I mean, because there's, nice. there's too much, there's too much complexity under this umbrella here. You know, there's nice. the rabidolaxins, there's, you know, annulins, there's just, there's too many yeah. different substances here. And, and it's the same with carbs. Like, like we use this word carbs and it programs <laughs> our brain. But, but in that, you know, like, well, you know, there's, 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 there's all kinds of different, what you call carbs. There's long-term, long chain oligosaccharides and, and they do incredible things. So part of the problem is just the way we program our brains. Um, the other part of the problem though, that's, that's part of that missing framework I would offer is titration. <clears throat> so when you look into the world of immunotherapy, there are people all the time who cure food allergies, food intolerances, full-blown food intolerances, 
by microdosing the thing they're intolerant to and you start, let's nice. say you're intolerant to, right. you know, what, whatever it is. And you just start with tiny little micro sized amounts, like, like, you know, a quarter size of a pea and over six months you build up to like a cup and simply by slow titration, the whole problem is gone. And, and you can explain a lot of that just simply by the acquisition of the bacteria that have the genes to break those things down. Nice. So the problem people run into, like our, our insulin doctor, I had carbs and ah, my blood sugar shot through the roof. Um, the problem is you just did too much. That's all. Right. Right. What, whereas if you, you, whenever, I just think a good rule of thumb, part of that new framework that's missing is that whenever you're eating a food you haven't been eating, you just start with very small amounts totally. and you take, take about a month and just titrate up. And what, what you'll do is you'll build up the taxa that feed on that new substance. And then essentially then you've developed the genetic horsepower to handle it. Whereas what exactly. the mistake virtually everybody makes totally. is, you know, I was full blown keto and then I went and ate like, you right. know, three, three baked potatoes and got sick. And it's like, well, of course you, you, <laughs> right. it was the dose. It, it's not the, totally. it's not the food, it's the dose. A hundred percent. Or someone coming off a vegan diet, they're going to eat meat and they just go and ham on it. They're not going to have the enzymes, the stomach acid, like all of the things that they need to be able to handle that. And then they're like, nope, my body hates meat or, you know, same thing with the, the carbs, right? Or it's usually more than three baked potatoes. Let me tell you when somebody's coming off of keto and they're, it, it's bender, it's right. bender, you know, yeah. and, and it's like, I, I, I fell asleep. I went into like a coma I like fell asleep. And you know, it's like, well, yeah, <laughs> your body is definitely not used to having to crank out that much insulin, you know, and then, you, right. then my, my gut was messed up. Oh, really? You know, it's just like, if you don't never eat junk food right now, if you went and got like a full on Burger King value meal and followed it up with some movie theater popcorn and a bunch of candy and chocolate and cheesecake, you're probably gonna feel a little sick, you know, <laughs> same thing. Um, totally, all right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much for your time. I cannot wait to read the way. And by the way, guys, it's the way immunity code diet. So we'll link that up. And also if you haven't read the immunity code, I would definitely recommend getting that too. Is it on audible, Joel, the immunity code? No, it, it, it it's one of our back on back. It need, it's ready to get on there. It's not yet though. We need to. All right. All right. There. That'll so, be cool. We'll, yeah. That's yeah. my encouragement. Audible is awesome. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then, um, we'll also link up your Veep nutrition website. So you guys can learn more about these different, you know, protocols, things that you have to help support you. If you're looking to improve your, what should I say? Your three metabolisms. <laughs> <laughs> and have thriving health so wow so appreciate you thank you so much for taking the time and you're just a wealth of knowledge i'm sure my people will be begging to have you back so thank you so much oh thank you tara it was great to just talk with a kindred soul so enjoy yeah. it yeah